Good evening once again. It's good to see everybody. Can I have you turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 15? Let me kind of set this scene. Of course, it is what we call Good Friday. Uh, as we come to Mark 15, of course, the Jews called it Passover, the 14th of Nisan. The night before, Jesus spent the evening with his disciples in the upper room, celebrating one last Passover together. It was at that time that Judas left the room to carry out his betrayal of Christ. While he was gone, the Lord instituted what we call communion, which was the sign of the new covenant that uh, was in Jesus' blood. We're going to celebrate communion in a little bit. But... Um, after they had finished uh, singing a hymn, John 14 ends with them leaving the upper room, making their way through the streets of Jerusalem towards the Mount of Olives, stopping briefly at the eastern gate, which was adorned with olive uh, and uh, grape carvings. Uh, they're giving them the uh, vine and the branch discourse, I believe, in the full moon of uh, that night. After that, they made their way across the Kidron Valley up the Mount of Olives, where Jesus then took Peter, James, and John with him into the garden, and uh, they, they uh, knelt somewhere to pray, and he went a little farther to pray. Uh, eventually, they fell asleep, as you well know. He woke them up a couple times. Third time, he just said, uh, go ahead and sleep on. But by that time, Judas was leading a uh, brigade of soldiers with torches and, uh, and spears to arrest Jesus in the garden. He was then taken to the house of Caiaphas, where he went through the first of a couple of mock trials, this one religious. After that, of course, they pronounced him guilty. They already knew what they were going to say. Uh, shuffle him off to Pilate's court. It was opening at 6 a.m. They wanted to make sure they were the first ones there. They got there, and there, of course, you remember how that they presented these charges against Jesus, the most serious one being he's an insurrectionist. He calls himself a king. There's no king but Caesar. Very serious charge. Pilate knew that it was because of envy the chief priests and all were uh, offering Jesus up to him. He wanted to let him go, but they really put the squeeze on Pilate for some reasons we haven't got time to get into tonight. A couple of mistakes, three mistakes, a couple of mistakes Pilate had made with the Jewish people, which put him on very shaky ground with Caesar. And the Jews knew it, the Jewish leadership. And so uh, they eventually said, look, this man makes himself a king. Uh, we have no king but Caesar. Anyone who, who uh, says he's a king is not a friend of Caesar. And Pilate knew they had him. So he washes his hands of Jesus' blood and uh, turns him over to those who would uh, beat him, scourge him. And then they led him off to Calvary or Golgotha to be crucified. We picked the story up a little after 8 o'clock in the morning. Remember now, he was on the cross by 9 a.m. So I'm assuming it's around 8, maybe a little after 8, where we picked the story up. Verse 21, Then they compelled a certain man, Simon of uh, a Cyrenian, the father of Alexander and Rufus, as he was coming out of the country and passing by, to bear his cross. And they brought him to the place Golgotha, which is translated place of the skull. Now, hang in there. I just want to kind of, you know, as we read this, of course, this is right out of the middle of the crucifixion story. We're focusing on this. And I want to focus our attention this, this evening um, on Simon, all right? And as I was thinking about this and kind of meditating on it, it's interesting how a person's life can change when they least expect it. I mean, you get up one morning and start the day like you have every other day of your adult life, when suddenly something happens that changes you in a way you never thought was possible, never imagined. This was the testimony of a man named Simon who lived in Cyrene which was a city in North Africa, 
uh, in what is now the country of Libya. Simon, of course, was a common Jewish name. And in all probability, this man was a pilgrim who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. What Simon couldn't have known when he got up that morning was how that before the day was done, he was not going to be the same man. He was not going to be the same man. Something was going to happen that day that would forever change him. And not just in a little way, I'm talking about change him deeply, profoundly, and irreversibly. You see, his path that day was going to intersect with the path of another man. A man I'm sure he never heard of. A man named Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, what happened suddenly, without warning, is sometimes these life-altering events happen. They come out of nowhere. When you least expect that something happens that radically changes you. And, and for Simon, you know, didn't went about his day like he had always gone about his day. But um, by the end, the result would be that Simon's life would be totally transformed. I have called this message the crossroad of life. The crossroad of life. The dictionary defines crossroad as, and I'm quoting, the place where two roads intersect, a point at which a vital decision must be made. Now, again, let me give you some background to set up the message. As I just said, Simon was probably a Jew who had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. It was the dream of every Jew who lived outside of Israel to go to Jerusalem once during their lifetime to celebrate the Passover. That was a dream that every Jew had who didn't live in Israel. And I'm sure that was the dream of Simon for many years. In fact, he probably had scraped and saved for years just to be able to make this trip. And while he was there, and I'm just trying to imagine in my mind's eye what it must have been like. Here he comes to town. This is the trip of a lifetime, all right? Finally, he gets to see the holy city. Uh, observe Passover right there by the temple. I mean, he's beside himself with joy and enthusiasm. And he's, you know, walking around, you know, like uh, Hick in the big city, you know? I mean, he's just really taking it all in. When suddenly he hears a commotion. He turns to see what's going on, and there he sees a crowd coming. And in front of the crowd was a Roman soldier who was carrying a placard that read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Now, whenever a person was condemned to die by crucifixion, the soldiers would make a procession to where the execution was to take place. And making up this procession would be four soldiers. One in front holding the sign that had written on it, the crime or the crimes, the person had been convicted of. In Jesus' case, he was convicted of being the leader of an insurrection, calling himself the king of the Jews. So he had one soldier in front holding the sign, two on either side of the prisoner who was carrying his cross, and then one soldier in the rear, behind the prisoner. And of course, behind all that was the crowd. Now the soldiers would purposely take a long, circuitous route through the city to where the crucifixion was to take place. They did that purposely so that as many people as possible would see the prisoner, the crimes he had been convicted of, and the punishment that was about to be carried out. See, Rome wanted this to be as visible a thing as possible. They wanted everyone to know what happens when you mess with the Roman government. And it's not pretty, it's violent. Crucifixion was not invented by the Romans, but they brought it to an art form, if I can put it that way. They perfected it. And during the first century, it said that they crucified over 60,000 uh, prisoners. And they did it very publicly. They always stripped the prisoner naked to, to create maximum shame. Then they would crucify the individual along or on a busy road so that maximum amount of people could see. And of course, people would mock and people would spit on the person. Again, the shame was incredible. This is what our Lord endured. But again, Rome wanted this to be uh, something that would deter anyone else from thinking about crossing the Roman government. 
Now, guys, no doubt by this point, Jesus was already physically drained. Remember now, he had spent the entire night, he was up all night, uh, spent the bulk of the wee hours of the morning in prayer before he was arrested in the garden about 3 or 3.30 in the morning. And then he was put through these two mock trials uh, and then on the cross by 9 a.m. But uh, during that time, as they were interrogating him, first at the house of Caiaphas, of course, the uh, chief priests had their own guards. And so the guards of the priests had beat up Jesus pretty good that morning. Then they sent him over to Pilate, and his Roman soldiers beat him up even more, pulling the beard out of his face, uh, so dis putting a bag over his head and hitting him with closed fists so he couldn't react because he couldn't see what was coming, uh, inflicting maximum damage. Isaiah tells us he was so badly beaten he was no longer recognizable as a human being. And then on top of the scourging, history says that many a man died at the scourging post, never made it to the cross. It was so violent. And the loss of blood our Lord incurred at the, uh, at the scourging post. All of this combined robbed him of any strength that he might have had to, to physically. It wasn't physically possible for him any longer to take a 150 to 200 pound cross up the hill to Golgotha or what we would call Mount Calvary. And so as Simon stood there watching this death march, I think he was just enthralled. Not in a good way, but he was just, you know, he just couldn't take his eyes off of this man. And he was, as he was there watching this death march, he saw the soldier marching with the sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. He saw Jesus stumbling under the weight of that cross. And finally, when he stumbled and fell, he could carry the cross no longer. As Simon's taking this all in, he feels something rest on his shoulder. He turns around and sees that a Roman soldier had laid the flat part of his sword on his shoulder. Now every Jew knew what that meant. Roman law said if a Roman soldier put the flat part of his sword on your sh shoulder, he was uh, enlisting you into service. It was Roman law. You couldn't refuse. He was, you were now enlisted into service to him to carry his gear one mile. Roman law. Or in this case, to carry the, a condemned criminal's cross. But this was what Jesus was talking about when he said in Matthew 5, 41, if they compel you to go one mile, go two. In other words, Jesus said, you must go the first mile by compulsion. It's law. You have no choice. You go the second mile by compassion. The compassion for a lost soul. Can you imagine? Everyone hated when these soldiers would take advantage of people. I don't know if they ever carried their own gear. Everyone hated uh, the fact when they put that sword on your shoulder and made you carry their gear for a mile. It was degrading. It was humiliating. It was just a terrible imposition. And yet as a Christian, can you imagine after the sh soldiers, okay, miles up. Oh, no, no. I'll take it for a second mile. What? What a witness. That's what Jesus said. Go the second mile as a witness. That the soldier would ask this Christian, why are you doing this? You don't, you're not bound by law to carry my gear a second mile, I know. I'm bound by love, though. The love for your soul. Now, of course, at this point, Simon wasn't a Christian. And um, here he's being compelled to carry the cross of Christ, a tremendous imposition, to say the least, especially for a guy on vacation. All right. You know how that goes. And I just feel at that moment, Simon was just furious. I just think he bitterly resented this imposition. I mean, he must have hated those soldiers. He, I know he must have hated this criminal whose cross he was being forced to carry. It was probably his intention when he got to Golgotha to fling the cross on the ground and to leave as quickly as possible so as to get back to his life, to get back to what he wanted to do. Now, I'm sure that was his plan when he first started out. But guys, let me just say this. I don't think that's what happened. I don't personally think 
That's what happened. By the time he got to Golgotha, he didn't just throw that cross and leave. We're not told what he did. I'm just telling you what I feel happened. I think he stayed. I think he stayed. You see, I believe something about Jesus compelled him to stick around. Something about Jesus caused Simon to want to stay. How interesting that Simon had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover and he ended up meeting the Passover lamb. And guys, this again was a meeting Simon hadn't planned on, but as his path crossed with Jesus' path, his life would be forever changed. You know, in many ways, and I kind of try to read my Bible when I see these stories, uh, I know they're placed here for our learning. So what is it in this story that the Holy Spirit might be wanting to communicate to me? You know, when you read your Bible, that's what you should be doing, right? Uh, all right, Lord, this is a historical event story. But you put it in your word for a reason. It goes far beyond history. It, there's a, a personal application in some way, principle maybe, something I can glean that will help me to uh, grow in my walk with you and so on. And I think in many ways, guys, the Holy Spirit is holding up Simon as an illustration of how a person's life can suddenly intersect with Jesus when they least expect it. And at that point, the Holy Spirit will seek to compel them to take up the cross and follow Jesus. Now, unlike Simon, who had no choice, we do have a choice. We do have a choice. You know, Mark tells us that Simon was coming out of the country and passing by. In other words, he, he was just doing his thing. He was just going about his business, okay? Uh, you know, and, and he had a routine that he was working off of. He had something uh, that he wanted to do, places he wanted to see, no doubt. I don't know if he knew anybody in Jerusalem, but if he did, uh, that was on the list to stop and see friends or family, right? Maybe even have Passover uh, dinner with them. But it's interesting how that Simon was just going about his business, not knowing how dramatically his life was about to change as he was suddenly introduced to Jesus. <laughs> this, guys, was the spiritual turning point in Simon's life. And let me say this. No one can bear the cross of Christ without experiencing a radical change in the direction of their life. You remember when you got saved? I remember when I got saved. And boy, was it interesting how that, like Simon, I'm just going about my business. I was uh, maybe 24 or 5, something like that. And, you know, at that age, I was working a full-time job. And uh, I was married a, a, a couple of years already. And, uh, and uh, you know, we're just going about uh, life and working and, and, and so on. And, and all of a sudden, I'm introduced to Jesus. Now, hear me out. I was raised in the Roman Catholic Church. I knew who Jesus was. But I had like a historical knowledge of Jesus, kind of like I knew, I know George Washington, <laughs> only from the pages of history. I knew Jesus from what I was taught in school and maybe what I read in the Bible, but uh, I didn't have a personal relationship. When I tell, tell you I was introduced to Jesus, I'm talking about Jesus through the Holy Spirit uh, invading my life and bringing about uh, this uh, intersection of our lives where suddenly I, I knew I needed him as my Lord and Savior. And when I opened my heart to him and I became his disciple, my life radically changed. Little did I realize that several years later he would call me to be the pastor of a church. <laughs> I wish he would have told me that before I got saved, I might not have signed up because I was terrified to speak in front of people. That was my big thing. I couldn't do it. But God takes the weak, the foolish, the base, the nobodies to do his best work through, right? Because that way when he works, he gets all the glory. That's my testimony, a weak, foolish, base, nobody that God just happened to use. You know, I'm an ordinary God that serves an extraordinary God. And whatever happens through my life, it's all him. It's all him, all right? 
But Simon's life changed because his life intersected with Jesus and he picked up Jesus' cross. Now, of course, he did all this literally. The Holy Spirit is using it to teach us some spiritual lessons. Of course, Jesus himself said in Luke 9, 23, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. That's the cost of discipleship. We cannot be a true disciple of Christ and yet still be in control of our lives. We, we cannot be a follower of Christ and still be a lover of the world and uh, of, of self and so on. Of course, Simon's desires and plans had to be denied for Jesus' sake that day. But see, bearing the cross always means saying no to self and yes to him. Because honestly, that's what it means to really be a Christian. And even though Simon only carried Jesus' cross literally that day for only maybe an hour or two at the most, he wound up carrying the cross figuratively for the rest of his life. Jesus said that before we take up the cross and seek to follow him, we must count the cost. Which begs the question, what does it cost you and me to carry our crosses for him? When I read stories of some of the old missionaries and things, or you know, people that have really laid down their lives for Christ, I, I'm really ashamed at the shallow level of commitment I have compared to them. And that's why I love to read biographies of great men and women of God, because it challenges me to go deeper. It challenges me to get out of my comfort zone, as they did. Now, one example was James Calvert, a Methodist missionary. And he felt like the Lord was leading him and his family out to Fiji, the island of Fiji, which at that time was inhabited by cannibals. But he was impressed in his spirit to go to this place to share the gospel with these folks. He lived in the 1800s, this missionary. And on his way to the Fiji Islands, um, the captain of the ship, knowing what he was planning on doing, tried to talk him out of it, tried to dissuade him from this course. He said, you will risk your life and all those with you if you go among such savages. The captain said that. Calvert's response was priceless. He said, we died before we came. I've told you that when native missionaries in India, these are indigenous uh, you know, Indians to their own country who were saved, uh, when they attempt to reach a new village, and these villages, we call them villages, that sometimes they can be 10 million people, so we would say it's a big city. But um, they always dig a grave on the outskirts of town before they enter the village because they know there's a good chance they're not coming out alive. And I think every time they dig a fresh grave before they enter into a village to preach the, the, the gospel to this group of people, by digging that grave, it's helping them to count the cost. Helping them to count the cost. Uh, they're going in with their eyes open. And many of them are killed for their faith. You know, in China, believers are martyred all the time. But the song that Chinese believers sing in face of this kind of persecution is, and I'm quoting now the song, How Glorious It Is to Die for Jesus. Can you imagine American Christians singing that song and really meaning it? I'm sure there are some. I don't think many. These folks truly, for them, as Paul said, for me to live as Christ, to die is gain. It's a win-win, whatever happens. The Lord lets me stick around a little longer, I can help more people come to Christ. If today's the day I go home, praise God, I get to see Jesus face to face. Wow. In fact, I was able to dig this statistic out from what I understand, a person can't even be a pastor of an underground church in China until they have been, A, imprisoned for preaching the gospel publicly, and then, B, once in prison, 
They have to preach to the prisoners and see so many converted that a church starts there in prison. And only then when they get out, if they ever do get out, are they considered pastor material and are eventually ordained as the pastor of an underground church. <laughs> I don't think you have too many celebrity pastors in China. Okay? Driving big cars and living in palatial mansions. So let me ask the question again. What does it cost us to follow Jesus? What does it cost us to follow? And, and have we paid the price with joy, whatever that cost has been? You know, why did Simon, and, and again, this is all circumstantial. I'm, I'm building a circumstantial case. I, I, I'm building a case based on circumstantial evidence. Nothing in Scripture actually says he stayed. Uh, after he carried Jesus' cross to Golgotha. I believe he did. And the question is, why did he stay when he got to Mount Calvary? Why didn't he throw the cross on the ground and leave to carry on with his life and plans? Well, I personally believe it was because Jesus had talked with him. I mean, can you imagine the Lord Jesus Christ not having talked to Simon? The very person, the person that was carrying his cross to the place of his execution. Can you imagine the Lord Jesus, even in his weakened state, would not have shared who he was with Simon? I'm the Messiah. I'm sure Simon asked him, what have you done? What did you do to, to have a sentence of crucifixion upon you? I'm the Messiah. And I have come into the world to be the light of the world and to save the lost, to seek and to save the lost. And Simon was lost. And I believe the Lord told him that even as Simon had come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, that at that, at that very moment, Jesus, the true Passover lamb, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, was on his way to die so that the judgment of God, listen, upon guilty sinners would pass over all who would receive him as Savior and King. I mean, how could Simon leave uh, after all that? How could he go back to his plans after interacting with Jesus? Jesus has a way, and if you're saved here tonight, you understand what I'm talking about. The Lord Jesus has a way when you, when you really, you know, your life really intersects with him, and you take up your cross because you know he's, he's, the way, the truth, and the life, and you give your life to him, you're never the same. And what you used to want to do, let's be honest, it's nothing now. It's, it's, it's emptiness. All the goals that I had before I got saved, you know, to uh, open a bar uh, or a deli. <laughs> you know, honestly, let me, let me tell you a story. Now, that, that sounds crazy, right? When we moved into our subdivision, it was just brand new, and they were still building stuff around. And so I told my father-in-law, I said, uh, Dad, I said, uh, I'd like to start, uh, and we can go in together, uh, I'd like to open a, 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 a liquor store or a deli. <laughs> I'm not kidding you. And I said, you know, they're building a little strip mall right down the road here. Let's go out and get a number off there and see if we can't rent something, right? I'm not kidding you. We pulled up into the parking lot and there was a sign on one of these stores that said, coming soon, Cove Liquor and Deli. <laughs> God said, no, you're not. No, you're not. I got other plans for you. I wasn't even a Christian at that time. But when I got saved, you look back and go, the, the, not that it's wrong to start a business. I'm not saying that. But you know, wanting to be successful and make money and, and, and have a nice house and drive a nice car, that was my goals. And, and I look back at that once I got saved, and it's like, how empty. That was my focus. That's all I was living for. You know what's really sad? When you bump into somebody you were friends with maybe in high school, like 40 years ago, and they're still doing the same things they were doing back then. You, as a Christian, you've moved a million miles away from that life. And you look at this person, and all you have is pit, excuse me, pity and, and compassion on them. Because how empty? How empty? 
I mean, again, guys, when a person has truly had an encounter with the living Christ, he or she can never go back to the way things were. They can never leave the presence of Jesus to go back to their old life. Now, look, we have good reason to believe that Simon trusted in Jesus as his Savior that day and eventually went home and led his whole family to the Lord. This man was so transformed by the cross of Christ and the person of Christ, of course, that the blessing of the cross overflowed onto his entire family. What do, you, what do I mean? I'll tell you. He's described in Mark's gospel as the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now, that says to me, Simon and his family must have been so well known to the Christians Mark was addressing in his gospel that they would have known immediately who he was referring to by simply saying, you're, you know, the father of Alexander and Rufus. Oh, yeah, Simon, sure, yeah. Because everyone knew the family. That's how strong a Christian family they were. Everyone knew them. That's how involved they were in the church. It's most likely that Mark's gospel was written first for the church in Rome. In Rome. If you look at the closing benediction of Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 16, verse 13, we read, Greet Rufus, chosen in the Lord, and his mother and mine. See, Rufus was such a strong Christian, and I believe, as we're going to see in a second, I believe that after Simon died, his one son, Rufus, at least Rufus, there might have been others in the family, uh, and his mother moved to Rome where they were uh, an integral part of the church there in Rome. So much so that Paul singles them out for special mention. At the end of his, that was pretty big stuff. When you were singled out by Paul at the end of one of his letters to, to a church somewhere, that meant you were like a pillar in the church. You were uh, a someone or a family that was well known. And so Paul singles out Rufus and his mom. In fact, he loved Rufus's mom, Simon's wife, so much that he said, you know, say hi to your mom. You know, she's my mom too. I just believe that Simon's encounter with Jesus on the road to Calvary not only saved him, but his wife, his two sons, and Lord knows how many others. I mean, what a home this must have been. What a transformation that must have taken place in this family after they became Christians. Guys, let me say this. Today, the only answer for problems in the home is the cross. It's cross-bearing. Cross-bearing. Only when the power of the cross penetrates, listen, the relationships of husbands and wives, parents and children, is there authority, stability, and security in the home. And when I talk about the power of the cross, guys, listen to me. I'm talking about the sacrificial love of self-denial, which is what the cross is emblematic of. Of course, we know that the Romans didn't put Jesus on that cross. Love did. Again, he said, no man takes my life from me. I give it freely for the sheep. It was love that nailed Jesus to that cross, not the Romans. He said, I could, I could at any time call to my father and he'd send me 72,000 angels to deliver me. Angels are pretty tough characters. You check uh, you know, the Old Testament. One night after dinner, one angel slaughtered 185,000 Assyrians. So you don't want to mess with angels. <laughs> she said, look, I could at any time call to my father. He'll send me 72,000 angels to deliver me. I don't want to be delivered. I've come to die. Because only through my death can you have life. The cross is a symbol of love, God's love, for fallen sinners. And the only way for your home, your marriage, your family to be all that God wants it to be, to be happy and in harmony and so on, is to apply the cross into your lives. And nobody, you can't say, well, yeah, when my wife picks up her cross, that's what I'm praying for. No, no, no. It doesn't work like that. Get your eyes off your wife. Get your eyes off your husband. Get your eyes off the kids. The only person that can pick up that cross is you. 
And when you take up that cross, when you begin to walk in self-denial and putting others you love above yourself, as Jesus did, that's when healing starts to come. That's when agape love is poured out. That's when miracles happen. All the fighting and bickering and division in homes and families and marriages, all the result of, of selfishness and pride. And the only thing that can kill that is the cross of Jesus Christ. Look, as we wrap it up, in Acts 13, verse 1, there's a list of men of the church in Antioch. And Antioch was um, one of the main churches uh, in uh, the uh, world at that time. As Jerusalem was uh, the main church where most of the Jews uh, from that area went. But then up in Syria, you had the church of Antioch. That's the church that Paul and Barnabas were uh, members of, uh, 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 elders of. The church that sent them out on the first missionary journey. And that's where I'm going with this. Up in Acts 13, verse 1, there's a list of the men uh, in the church of Antioch who sent Paul and Barnabas out on their first missionary journey. And the name of one is Simeon. See it there? Who is called Niger. Now, Simeon is another form of Simon. And Niger is a word that means black and was the regular surname given to those with dark skin that came from Africa. Remember, Cyrene was in northern Africa. This could very well be the Simon that carried Jesus' cross to Golgotha. He not only got saved, but became a leader in the church in Antioch, moved up there after he got saved. Nothing in Africa anymore. I want to be where God's moving. Moved his family up to Antioch, became an elder in the church there. This could be the very same Simon that carried Jesus' cross, got saved, and listen, was instrumental in sending the first missionary team into the Gentile world to evangelize Gentiles. I mean, think about it, okay? Blow your mind a little bit. Think about it. Could it be that we Gentiles in this very room tonight in some way are the fruit of Simon of Cyrene's ministry? All because one day, to his bitter resentment, he was forced to carry the cross of a condemned Roman prisoner named Jesus. And guys, the lesson is this. I believe the Spirit of God wants to teach us. When you pick up the cross and follow Jesus, not only will your life be forever changed, listen to me, it will impact everyone around you. Not just a little bit, but profoundly and deeply, especially your spouse and your kids, your family will be radically transformed. But what did Jesus say? Pick up your cross once and you're done? Pick up your cross when? Daily. So, you did pretty good yesterday. You were pretty unselfish. But now what do you think? You got a couple days grace now? You can be, go back to being selfish for, you know. And to pick up your cross every single day, denying yourself and follow in Jesus' footsteps. Jesus said that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, in other words, germinates, it stays a single grain of wheat. But if it dies, it produces what? Much fruit. It's only when we die to self can God really bring through our lives fruit of the Spirit. Much fruit. Our lives will be filled with the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control that are the fruits of the Holy Spirit and can only come when we die to self. Because I'll tell you what, pride and selfishness will choke out every beautiful thing God wants to do in your life. And we're all susceptible to it, aren't we? That's why Jesus said, you've got to take up your cross every day. Every day that you wake up, you say, Lord Jesus, today I want to lay my life on the altar of sacrifice. I don't want to do my thing. I don't want to be selfish. I want to follow you. I want to be you to the people I love especially. And Lord, will you take me today and use me for your glory? If you go into your day with that mindset where you're consciously praying that and this is your goal for the day, by God's grace, he'll supply the power. 
look, we're done. But let me just say this. I think Jesus, I, I know he is. Jesus, through the Holy Spirit, is looking for Simons today who will take up his cross and follow him to Golgotha, Calvary, to heed his call is to become a blessing to your generation in your home, in your church, and in this world. But guys, let me just say this. We cannot adequately present a crucified Christ without living a crucified life which means absolute surrender to his will and his purposes. I don't need to remind you that crucifixion Friday preceded Resurrection Sunday, right? Jesus had to die before he was raised in power. The same is true with us. We have to die to self before we can ever begin to live the resurrection life, the life of power and fruitfulness and victory and so on. We have to die. And young people, can I just say this to you? Can I encourage you to fight the temptation to approach your Christianity with a mindset that says, what's in it for me? So a lot of churches facilitating that mindset. And they're uh, tailoring their services. It's a big production. It's an entertainment thing, okay? Uh, this is where the celebrity pastors thrive. Uh, those who are funny. And those that are, you know, hip, you know, hipster pastors, you know, with the skinny jeans, you know, and, uh, and that ship has sailed, uh, you know. But I, I think that, and I've been reading some interesting articles about that, I think that the novelty has worn off. And a lot of young people are looking for churches that are not going to, you know, try to wow them and, and entertain them and so on. They're looking for churches that will teach them the truth. I was just reading uh, in a devotion a couple days ago. Um, what was his name? He was a Scottish preacher. I've got his name. Big guy. And uh, after he got out of seminary, he applied to 22 or three churches before somebody hired him on as a pastor. And the reason was because... I think it was Marcus Dodd. I think that was his name. Because Marcus Dodd so trusted in God's word and in the power of God's word to transform a life, he purposed in his heart he would never teach it without, with any emotion at all. In fact, he wrote everything down on paper and he just read it. <laughs> Very stoically. Just read it. Never raised his voice. Never any inflection of... of, of you know, uh, of uh, passion or anything like that, just read it. And a lot of people couldn't get their minds around this guy. But then it began to sink in somewhere along the line because as the writer was talking about Marcus Dot, they said people would say they go home and were not affected at all. But then they began to think about the message because it was all about the message. He didn't draw any attention to himself. And after they left service thinking, well, that was nothing. That was kind of boring. The word of God was penetrating their heart. And they started thinking about it. And the truths began to grip them and lives began to change. Marcus Dodd went on to pastor for over 20 years. And he changed hundreds if not thousands of lives before he was hired on as a professor of theology. Now, I'm, I'm not Marcus Dodd, okay? I don't plan on just reading my messages, but I do think there's a lot to be said for somebody who has that kind of faith in the power of God's word. That he doesn't have to embellish it with theatrics, you know, and, and uh, fancy presentations and uh, so on and so forth. Young people, God's word is living and powerful. And you know what? Try to look past the theatrics and the hype and all the gimmicks. Somebody just said they were at a, a, a church, went with a friend, kind of support him in this new church he was going to. 
And one of the first things they did after the service opened was to set off the smoke machine and the lighting and the smoke and boom and the music. And I'm thinking, wow, you know what? You know, I, I'm too tired. <laughs> I mean, honestly, I see some of these pastors, they are the epitome of energy. I don't know if they're pounding down Red Bulls before service or what. Man, they are so up, it's incredible. And I'm like, you know, sometimes, you know, Sunday morning I'm up at 3.30 going over my notes and praying. By the time I get there, I'm dragging a little bit. Especially after I'm done, I go home on Wife all day. I crash. I don't just fall asleep. I go into a coma for a couple hours. All right, enough of that silliness. But look, let me just say this. As we're talking about the cross, let me just end with this. Don't just sing about the cross. Don't even just wear a cross. Bear the cross. How do you do that? You start with a mindset. I think we've all gotten too comfortable. When I say, what does it cost you to take up the cross? What does it cost me? That's what I, it's always reflexive. Well, what does it cost me? I mean, I have a wonderful church, people that love me, that give me a great salary and all. What does it really cost me? Now, it may cost us something in the future. We shouldn't feel guilty that we live in a country where we have freedom of religion and many blessings. But if the day should ever come when all that ends and it's taken from us, are we going to still love Jesus and serve him? And sing about the glories of heaven. And if I have to die today, praise God, I'm ready to go. I want to see Jesus. It's just a challenge to you. To ask the Lord, Lord, if I'm in a comfort zone, will you lead me out into something for your sake that will challenge me? I need to be challenged. I feel like I've gotten, you know, I'm, I'm just going through the motions. So may God give us grace. May God give us grace. The cross changed Simon's life, and if we allow it, it'll change all of our lives too. May God give us the grace to ask him to change our lives radically for his glory. Father, we thank you for the story of Simon and how his life was radically transformed by taking up your cross and following you all the way to Calvary. And Lord, I believe when he got there, well, you had cap captured his heart. You had opened his eyes. I don't think he could have left that place if he had wanted to. And I think as he saw you nailed to that cross and the love that you had, I think he stayed there all day. I think he wept. I think he was broken. I think he accepted you as his Lord and Savior. I think he went home and was used to transform his whole family. And then from that point, his family transforming many lives for you. Lord, that could be our testimony if we want it to be. So, Lord, give us grace. And we ask now, Lord, that you would bless our time in communion. We thank you. We ask it all in your precious name. And Lord Jesus, Amen. we are speechless in the presence of that kind of love. The love you showed for us, Lord, unworthy sinners that we are. How you poured your love out. How you allowed your love to nail you to that cross. You suffered indignities at the hands of those that you made. You're the creator of the universe. You spoke everything into existence. You didn't have to submit to that kind of shame, humiliation, and torture. But you gave your life freely for those that you love. By your great love, wherewith you loved us, you rescued us from divine judgment and eternal damnation. You rescued us and adopted us into your family. We have an inheritance waiting for us now. We are heirs with God, of God, co-heirs with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Lord. We look forward to the day when the angel shouts, the trumpet blasts, and we hear your voice saying, come up here.
and we are transformed. We are made like you as we see you as you are. To never experience another tear or a pain or a sorrow or death. We wait for that day, Lord. But until then, give us grace to be busy about our Father's business. To take up that cross every day, it's not about us. Forgive us if we made our Christianity all about what you're going to do for us instead of how we're going to live for you. Forgive us, Lord, for our selfishness. Work in us that we would take up that cross in utter humility and walk with you each day, laying our lives on the altar of sacrifice, saying each day, Lord, today, here I am, take me, use me. I am your servant. I am your instrument. However you choose to use me, I submit. All, the only thing that matters is your glory. So, Lord, we thank you. We ask, Lord, that you would work in the heart of every person in this room who does not know you. Maybe they think they know you. Maybe they went to church when they were younger. Maybe they were baptized and confirmed. I don't know. I was. I thought I knew you until you crossed my path, opened my eyes, and caused me to see what a relationship with you was really all about. My life has never been the same. And so, Lord, touch their hearts, open their eyes. Save them, Lord, so they stop clinging to religion and start clinging to you as a relationship. And we just thank you, Lord. Father, we ask you to bring folks up front if they want to pray to receive you. Today is the day of salvation. That they not put off till tomorrow what they must do right now because they may not see tomorrow. So, Lord, give them grace right now to come forward to receive you. And the rest we ask, Lord, that you would guide us home safely. That, Lord, you would give us a solemn weekend as we contemplate how they laid you in that grave and they rolled that stone over the opening. And there you lay for three days and three nights. Friday, the, your disciples scattered in fear and sorrow. But as you said, your hearts are going to sorrow for a time, but then will be filled with great joy. That joy happened Sunday morning. And so, Lord, that's the focus of our next service. Give us grace. As we meditate on the solemnity of Good Friday, may we rejoice in the utter joy of Resurrection Sunday. Thank you, Lord. Father, we ask all this in your precious name. Amen. Amen.